In 1906, Pablo Valencia dared the journey from Mexico to California in search of gold. He survived without water for a week, seven days. He was rescued and documented the experience of thirst. Saliva becomes thick. A lump seems to form in the throat. The tongue swells so large that it squeezes past the jaws. The throat so swollen that breathing becomes difficult, creating a terrifying sense of drowning. The face feels full due to the shrinking of the skin. Many people begin to hallucinate. The eyelids crack and the eyeballs begin to weep tears of blood. When Pablo Valencia was found, his skin was like purplish gray leather, scratched but with no traces of blood. His lips had disappeared as if amputated. His nose withered to half its length. His eyes trapped in a winkless stare. This is not a film about saving the environment. It's a film about saving ourselves. Because whatever one's environmental, political or religious opinions, whatever one's race, sex or economic standing, whomever of us goes without water for a week, cries blood. There is always a lot of focus on, well, what's the environmental impact? And that's a perfectly valid issue and concern. The abuse of water and the taking of excess of water, diminishing flows and levels can destroy the sustainability of ecosystems. But we can't, in the name of preventing environmental impacts, there's a mentality that says, well, as long as we're not causing any significant impacts, we should be able to use the water any way we want, including selling it, exporting it for private gain of a few. When, you, when it's all said and done, people need water to survive. That's what, that's what the bottom line is. When we search the universe for life, we search for water. Because it is only from liquid water that all known forms of life exist. The blue planet, the only planet known to harbor life, the only planet known to be flowing with water. Water management has always been of key importance to humans. The Egyptians depended entirely upon the Nile. The Romans expanded the boundaries of engineering to use gravity to bring water to their cities. Ancient societies cherished water, molded their lives around it, and even worshipped it as a god. For whatever reason, between 800 and 1000 AD, climate change dried up most of the Mayans' local water supply. Farmers were forced to extend their agriculture into the jungle forest to grow food. There was not enough water for both the crops and trees, so the forests died. The soil eroded, air humidity decreased, food decreased. Mayan leaders prayed to the god of rain, but the regular rain season brought little water. The hydrologic cycle was damaged. Life in the cities became less civilized, as the main focus of Mayan life became providing food and water. People abandoned the cities to begin a new life in the forests, in hopes that there was still a sustainable watershed there. There wasn't. But as we enter a new era combining high technology with the demands of global economic trade, we're entering into a unique stage of history. Water, which is the source of life itself, instead of being common and universal to everybody because we all depend on it, profit is made out of the running of and the delivery of water to people and to, to communities. Those that have the ability to pay will have access to the water. Those who do not have the ability to pay will go without. And therefore, it's a life and death situation in the final analysis on the basis of profit.
Thank you very much, and it's a great honor to be on the stage with you. I want to talk, comrades and friends, about uh, a global water crisis in which we know that the world is actually running out of water. And that wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't supposed to be able to happen because we were all taught back in, I don't know, grade three or six or whatever, that there's a, fi there's a cycle. When it rains, the water falls from the clouds down all the way to the ground. It soaks into the ground and then the grass and trees grow. Sometimes there's so much water underground that lakes and rivers just pop up, like when you squeeze a box of apple juice. The rivers carry the water back to the ocean. Inside the ocean, the water floats up to the sky as clouds again. Then the wind pushes the clouds towards the land and it rains again. This all happens over and over, forever and ever. How is our water being polluted? Agriculture uses chemicals to increase farming productivity. Ironically implemented to counter a diminishing water supply, these chemicals pollute the groundwater. Automobile gas emissions pollute the clouds. But perhaps the most damaging culprit is industry. Water pollution has been linked to the rising miscarriage rates in women, lower sperm counts in men, and it is so globally severe that the Malaysian government proposed the death penalty for anyone caught contaminating water. This is the, uh, the most uh, polluted river in the United States. Um, there's active uh, polio, uh, tuberculosis, hepatitis. Well, we try and, and reason with the aliens and you know, tell them what's in the water and try and get them out. None of the agents are going to get in that water to get any of these aliens. They're just contaminated. Um, we have a gate that we deploy across the river down the ways a little bit, and uh, we'll deploy that gate, and then they'll all pretty much go back into Mexico. We already have a um, battery of shots that we, we take here um, at the local hospital. It's about 18 different shots for if any agent falls in that water to keep from getting contracting something. What we saw today was a river of human sewage. The water smells like nothing you could ever imagine. As much as 25,000 liters per second flow. Pasan los desechos de los hospitales, de las escuelas, de todo lo que ocurre en la ciudad y que descarga el agua en el drenaje profundo viene a dar por aquí. Salen incluso pedazos de humanos. A veces de los hospitales desechos, alguno que otro peto pasa por aquí, perros muertos. It goes into the northeast where people grow crops that later on are sold in the Mexico City market. So we are being poisoned. Our wastewater is returning to us in the form of food. When you look into the rivers, you can see bubbles. That means that the rivers are losing oxygen. Contamination and pollution of the water systems is creating cholera and, and, and water diseases are killing more children today than malaria or AIDS or even wars themselves. And the wetlands would normally have been a, a process whereby there would have been some uh, cleansing of that taking place. It goes through uh, the, the wetlands and it uh, comes out more purified into the river systems, etc. But what happens when the wetlands are destroyed, where we poison a certain amount of water that can never really be fully recycled? What we now know is that we are polluting and depleting this finite stock of fresh water so fast that we're now mining the groundwater faster than it can be replenished. It rains. The water hits the ground and percolates into the soil, collecting underground into what are known as aquifers or groundwater. But how much of our finite supply of water is underground? We can only estimate, as there is no reliable method to accurately measure, which is why our growing dependency on groundwater is such an urgent concern. The fabled Atlantis in the Middle East had a real city attached to it. It was called Ubar. It disappeared and no one could figure out what happened. And then some archaeologists found it. 
what they realized is it collapsed into the desert sand from groundwater pumping. Not only could it happen, it is happening today in Florida. Giant sinkholes have emerged, all of a sudden just big cavities in the ground opening up. The effects are not always evident, as with a sinkhole or lost city. Entire regions can slowly and evenly sink as a watershed is depleted. Perfect example is where Mexico City is now. It was once an oasis of water. When the Spanish came, they didn't want their new city to look like uh, Venice. They wanted it to look like Madrid. And they used slave labor to cut down all the trees that would protect the water sources and to dredge the, the water systems. And what happened was that they just destroyed the water table. And of course, that was one thing when there were 10,000 people living there. It's another when there are, what, maybe 25 million. They've taken the rest of the water underneath the city. The city is literally sinking in on itself and these great big churches are beginning to, you know, go sideways. And Mexico is having to go further and further and further away from its local water sources because there aren't any left to find water. Human ingenuity has found out ways to get water from beneath the surface of the earth for thousands of years. What's changed though is the technology. We now pump approximately 30 billion gallons of groundwater every day. community started tapping into our aquifers at a time when there really were not other demands on the resource. The way that the law works is that they are allowed to use limitless quantities. And then the added kicker is that the law said, if you don't use it, if you don't divert all of this water, you may lose your water right. So with that scenario, it doesn't encourage conservation of water. I mean, why, why am I going to go ahead and quit pumping to save water and lose everything? So then a guy like me who may want to quit pumping to quit depleting the aquifer, I have to keep pumping in order to keep my water rights. When we pump water for such irrigation, some of it percolates back into the ground, which is called recharge or return flows. So long as we pump no more than what is recharged, we are using the groundwater sustainably. The problem is that we're pumping up to 15 times more water from the ground than is returning back into it, creating a global crisis. One thing that most people don't know is that the world is desertifying very quickly. We are becoming a desert in many places. Our soil is eroding, simply meaning that overgrazing, winds and flooding damage the top layer of earth, essentially hardening it to the point that rainwater cannot easily soak into the ground our life source literally slips away from us, back into the ocean through sewers and rivers, draining the land of its moisture and life. The country that a man is changed in the green a výsledkom potom je, že všetka voda je skumulovaná v oceáne. Extreme weather, a world of hurricanes and violent storms over the ocean, while the interior land receives less and less rain, or violent harsh storms that simply erode the land more. Zemská kvôra kontinentu odnáčuje a príspevo kumulácie tejto vody v oceánoch spôsobuje zaťaženie zemskej pôdy, kvôry, čo môže spôsobiť pnutie v štruktúrach zemskej kvôry a to spôsobuje zemotrasenie potenciálne možné tsunami vlny, ktoré sme boli svetkami v roku 2004. Deforestation is a major contributor to soil erosion. Tree roots absorb water and thus hold the watershed in place. When they leave the land, so does the water. Because the forests that held the water have all been logged, there is no place where the water can be stored. The rain still comes and runs away as instant surface runoff. Just what I feared. He's formed a gang and they're whooping it up for a flash flood. 
were rushing down the canyon. They made a wall of water 20 feet high. Look out! No longer satisfied with flash floods, the gang is planning bigger and wetter floods. Junior's getting dangerous. He's getting tougher and bolder every day. But groundwater pumping cannot alone be blamed for our desertification crisis. Cities are growing and expanding. For the first time in human history, more people living in cities than in the countryside. We have replaced permeable ground with hardscape, with roofs, with parking lots, uh, with homes. If it rains and the water doesn't hit the ground, but hits the sidewalk or street instead, it can't soak into the ground and make trees. It just slides down the street back to the ocean and makes more clouds. This means that the ground gets really dry and the grass and trees die. Clearly, there is much more unpaved than paved land in the world, but the effect is cumulative and should not be underestimated. Celo svetovo zhruba 750 miliard kubíkov vody. Tento proces sa odštartoval po druhej svetovej vojne. Dá sa povedať, že teraz sme v polčase rozpadu vodného cyklu a o 50 rokov bude vlastne definitívny kolaps s vodnými zdrojami na globálnej úrovni. There is another problem with increased urbanization, which is our continued insistence to build housing for growing populations that demand more water than local watersheds can provide. People in the housing development and, and they make money by turning houses and they're very large companies. So their goal is to avoid the water issue that might limit the number of houses they might have. Instead of adapting our development to the available water supply of a region, we choose to force the world's water supply to adapt to our desired locations. What dams do is change the hydrologic cycle. They provide water during those months when the natural flow patterns do not. What's happened is that we built these huge hydro dams mainly to create uh, hydropower and hydroelectricity. And when we've done that, we've done it in a very narrow framework. And we haven't thought about the fact that we're going to need water for other purposes. In this quest to conquer nature, as some label it, we've constructed close to 50,000 large dams worldwide. But if we are headed towards desertification by allowing too much rainwater to run off into the sea, then is it not to our benefit to dam water and prevent it from reaching the sea? One of the basic functions of rivers is to carry stuff from one place to another. And that stuff, which is really critical to the health of an entire watershed, it becomes completely and wholly interrupted when you build a dam. Dammed rivers fail to carry such nutrients and minerals downstream through the watershed, resulting in more soil erosion. Less percolation when it rains, more runoff and thus an increase in the desertification problem. When you trap water, it stops moving. And when it stops moving, it heats up because it's this nice warm soup full of nutrients that are not making it downstream. But then those things die and then they eat up oxygen. All of a sudden, you've got a major water quality problem. A river is the lifeblood of an ecosystem, just like the veins and arteries bring blood to every part of our organism. When we have choked arteries, that's what's called a heart attack. A dam is the choking of the artery of the planet. So we really have to face the crisis here that what we were taught in school, that this finite amount of water could never run out, is technically true. But if you can't access it because you took it from an aquifer and you poured it into a desert to grow cotton, or you polluted it, it's no, of no use to us. And that's what we need to get into our heads. And there's nowhere to go in the world to get away from this. Rich people and people who live in water-rich countries will get away from it longer than people who are facing it now. But the world water crisis will face us all. But if there is going to be one single thing that is going to slam us into reality, it is going to be running out of water. We see all sorts of fresh water in our lakes and say, well, you know, what's the problem? We've got lots of fresh water. Once you drain a lake, that's it. There is no more water. We have to start focusing in on what is the renewable supply which comes through the hydrologic cycle. 
we are creating a situation where we have less and less of that renewable supply left. And with the help of water scientists, we have to really start to assess how much water we really do have to work with. What is, what is that renewable supply and trying to define it? That's the task at hand. We must be able to find out what the limits are and how to live within them. But instead of our governments coming together and saying we have a limited amount of time to come together and find the solution, what they've done is they've handed power over to big water companies who want to create a kind of water cartel. Uh, Suez, Veolia, which used to be Vivendi, and RWE Thames. And these companies are all in the top 100 top corporations. I mean, the water division of Suez has 400,000 employees. I mean, try saying no to them if you're a little third world country, right? So that one day, every single drop of fresh water in the world will be privately owned and controlled. Up until the 1980s, really, if water was privatized, they were, they were companies within a country. So France was mostly privatized, but the companies that then became the giants were just French companies delivering water locally. Water privatization in France, because of the multinationals that are so powerful there, and because of their long history there, is so ingrained that even the president of France wasn't able to stop it. François, à un certain moment de son, de, de son mandat, a été euh, rappelé à l'ordre, si je puis dire, par cette dictature économique, et il n'a pas pu nationaliser les, les, les entreprises de l'eau. C'est un système qui est, qui est très puissant, c'est une machine qui est sans état d'âme. And then in the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher came to power and the Thatcher Revolution came into effect and she privatized all the water in Great Britain. And that's when these big companies decided that they could start going global. At the same time, um, the UN was beginning to explore the language of water as a, an economic good and a commodity. And the very first time was at a very important conference in Dublin in 1992, which for the first time named water as a good. So you get the Thatcher, Reagan, uh, market economy ideology growing over here. You've got the companies all ready to go because they've been delivering inside nation states. And now you've got the UN saying, okay, we're, we're ready to start thinking about water differently. It's not a right. So it all kind of converged together. While the World Bank is created after the Second World War to bring financial stability and development to the developing world, and, and it's supposed to be pooled money from the wealthier countries to help develop the Global South. However, what's happened is that the World Bank has hooked up with the three big water private service companies in Europe. They basically started to work their way into the developing world. And the World Bank would say, in exchange for debt relief, now we want you to privatize water. The WTO comes in with rules that basically establishes in a new constitutional framework. And it's run by what's called the Quad, which is the United States, Canada, the European Union and Japan. And the Quad makes all the decisions. It's their corporations that set the agenda. They decide when the meetings are going to be held. And they had thousands of military police with you know, the full riot gear and so on. And the farmers had a huge march. And the head of South Korean Farmers Union is a man named Lee Kyung Hai. And he came from a devastated community where people were killing themselves. He climbed up on this police barricade. He took a knife and stabbed himself in the heart, rocked back and forth on top of this fence and fell. He died a couple of hours later in the hospital. And this became an enormously important symbol. These trade rules are not some dry academic thing on a piece of paper. These are rules that affect people's lives, and these are rules that are killing people. This is the new colonialism. It doesn't come in ships. But the facts, we've heard the facts at this meeting. We've heard about the underachievement and the failures of privatization. And we know that ultimately, these corporations aren't accountable to the communities that they serve. 
They're accountable to their shareholders, and nothing's going to change that. People think that water privatization is just a problem in the global south and the developing world, but that's just simply not the case. We have the very same situation in the U.S. the very same story, whether it's in Atlanta, Georgia, or Buenos Aires, Argentina. It was a big push at the time. Privatization was the word. Everybody wanted to privatize something. And frankly, I don't, I'm not opposed to privatization. We privatize our recycling pickup, and we, but this water was, was different. But we did sign a contract with United Water for 20 years for operation and maintenance of our water system. For these companies, when their name has, has been tarnished because of their malpractice and their mismanagement, it can be a big advantage to, to use another name. And Suez often uses the name Ondeo, and very rarely the brand Suez is, is, is visible. And the same, of course, with Vivendi. Vivendi had gained a, a very bad reputation because of their records in failed privatization and mismanagement. And they were suddenly reinvented under this name Veolia, and a huge advertising budget was spent to create a positive feeling around this new, uh, this new brand name. Of course, advertising is a crucial factor in the way these companies are trying to save their image. And almost immediately started having service problems and citizens could not drink the water unless it had been boiled. There are no clear-cut performance uh, requirements and performance guarantees. We did require in the contract that they take all of our 550 employees for labor reasons. They usually slash the workforce, sometimes in half. So they cut out about 200 employees, and that could have been part of the reason for the service delivery. They couldn't find out where all the piping connections were. The workers themselves were the people that knew where things were. The mayor at the time was Bill Campbell, and Suez gave him a $6,900 campaign contribution, but he wasn't running for office a trip to Paris where he and a female companion stayed in the best hotels and were wined and dined. Although two of the three water corporate giants are based in France, and French water has been privatized since the time of Napoleon, a small percentage of French regions have maintained their own water distribution through their city councils. The city of Grenoble managed its own water for over a century, providing good quality water at low prices to consumers. Suez bribed our mayor. Le maire de Grenoble a choisi de privatiser à Lyonnaise des Eaux Suez. Tous les services publics sont bien moins chers que les services privatisés. There hasn't been one example in the world where there hasn't been a hike in, in, in the water rates. Il n'y avait aucune raison logique de privatiser ce service qui marchait très bien. Sa décision de privatisation était en échange d'avantages personnels avait acheté le maire de Grenoble. I'm not a big fan of government control on a lot of stuff. I've been in government. I've worked in the federal government, I worked in state government, I worked in local government and I see an extraordinary amount of corruption. Right now, we have a number of uh, state senators that have just been indicted in Alaska for corruption, even with the oil industry. But, but what was the amount of corruption? A few thousand dollars. It's not the money, it's the power. Not many people know that prior to being president, Vicente Fox was the general manager for Coca-Cola in Latin America. So Coca-Cola received some of the largest water concessions in Mexico during the Fox administration. And this is something that really needs to be opened up for serious debate. People do not realize the extent to which there is a direct giveaway on the part of governments of water resources and services to industries locating in their jurisdiction. Well, I want to be very clear about the situation in Mexico that, that President Vicente Fox has given us no special favors on water issues or anything else along that line.
The largest water concession given by the government in the whole country was to a Coca-Cola bottling plant. It takes as much water as it wants. You could say that Coca-Cola ruled Mexico. If you really look at the, uh, at the controversy of whether water should be owned privately or water should be owned publicly, uh, you, I see abuses on both sides. When water is only owned by the government, you have an opportunity for abuse. When a, water is jointly owned by someone who has a capital interest, a private interest, a profit interest, and government, you have a partnership that tends to balance those things out. The new face of colonialism comes in the form of Coca-Cola. You walk anywhere in Africa and it's Coca-Cola water. You cannot get anything but, you cannot drink the water out of the tap, you can't even find purifiers. You are an absolute slave to this company. Dasani is not meant to be a substitute for municipal supply, so we are absolutely in support of robust, comprehensible, and equitable water and sanitation systems. In this country, you have to pay more for this water than you pay for the same amount of Coca-Cola. So that, that's something. Dasani is in plastic bottles, and Coca-Cola are in glass bottles. Now, when you look at uh, the, the price difference, what you're looking at is that the cost of, of producing those bottles is much higher. We have looked at, in the past, of bottling Dasani in the glass, but uh, the plastic package is becoming very popular now, and what we're looking at is what the customers want. As you look at new, new ways to develop business, you look at also what the customer wants and needs are. The situation with the cost of Dasani is more about the packaging. And also, plastic bottles are taxed at a higher rate than glass bottles. Street per se understands in 50 years this is the commodity to be invested in. There's a sunset out there, there's a horizon out there that's coming closer and closer for oil, but not for water. There are at least a dozen publicly traded water indexes that deal only with water, trading it on the open stock market. Five years ago, this didn't exist. Now it's just simply exploding. It takes uh, two players to really make the corruption happen. Uh, first of all, we have uh, corporations who are often greedy, but corporations are not uh, social service agencies. They're there to make a profit. And what happens too often is that the water hunters are able to come in and either the government is corrupt or the laws are not sufficient to protect the water resources. As a water hunter, you just go out and you try to find a water source. It's not going to cost you a lot of money to clean up. The problem is getting it and holding on to it. Canada had 12 contracts for the bulk export of water and arbitrarily with the change of government in British Columbia canceled those contracts. When you have a change in government, the previous government's commitments are subject to renegotiation. And that's just the way it is. So when you're looking at water owned by someone else that you have to get a contract with, that's not a secure commodity anymore. The only way to have a secure commodity is to create it yourself by desalinization. Many do not see the harm in depending on desalination for our future water needs. And suddenly many countries in the world are looking to desal and building new desal plants as the alternative and this is going to save them. But to do that we require a great deal of fossil fuels and burning of fossil fuels which contributes to global warming which in turn contributes to the climate change problem in general. Uh, in order to address one problem, we end up creating a new problem. We already have an energy shortage. Where are we going to get the energy to use desalination? And uh, a lot of corporations are saying nuclear technologies. Well, nuclear technologies are really not viable. We have no current plan to deal with nuclear waste. You know, it's no different from saying to ourselves that we're going to go into space after making a mess out of this planet. We go into Mars, we relocate there, or we colonize space itself and colonize another planet. 
And having made a mess out of our own situation, having failed to live up to our own responsibilities in relationship to nature, we then move on to destroy another piece of nature and leave the mess behind. The fact that there aren't more plants in the world is because it's a cost factor. Only rich countries or the World Bank or big corporations or a combination of all three are going to be able to afford to, to build desalination plants. But even on the slim chance that technology can advance quickly enough, that the energy costs and needs lower enough to make a global desalination solution possible, the question still remains, why? Why forfeit the water we already currently have? Why freely give it to others only so they can sell it back to us at whatever cost the demand allows? When you have communities that are looking to extend their water supplies, they'll pay what they feel the value of that supply is worth. There are 87 corporations now building desalination plants, and the biggest water company of all is General Electric followed by Procter & Gamble and Dow Chemicals getting into it. These are all companies that have seen the writing on the wall. And the writing on the wall is that water is the hottest property out there. I think you can add a 15% on that. I think if 15% is responsible, some investors will require 30. Uh, and if you can't offer 30, they're not interested in investing. What we actually have is that these big corporations are going to profit from dirty water. So they don't want to see the, the pollutants not going into the water in the first place. They want to have a, uh, a model where they can step in and provide very expensive technologies to clean up pollution after it occurs. I wondered when I looked at the UN Millennium Goals why they didn't include goals around pollution and cracking down on the fact that if you can't use the rivers and lakes in your area then you're forced to mine groundwater. Well it's as clear as a bell to me now. It's because they're raking in the money. Who's going to own that water when General Electric has it to clean? Does it pass through them but still belong to the public? I don't think so. So it becomes a product that, you, that is a result of your process and then you own it. Who ends up owning these desal plants? Because if these desal plants are in private hands or even in government hands, because after all, water is the source of life. These desal plants are the way in which we get access to water. Then those desal plants and who owns them ends up controlling our lives. Bottom line, uh, water is a good investment, period. Any place in the world. How much do you pay for your bottle of water? You can fill that bottle of water at the tap for practically nothing. And the difference between what's in the bottle and what's in the tap is, in most cases, insignificant. You know, we do not advocate bottled water over tap water. You know, consumers generally buy bottled water because of convenience, because of access. I wouldn't say that it's healthier. It is a healthy alternative. Because of the world water scarcity, uh, the Great Lakes have been perceived to be a target. We were concerned about our wetlands, and actually my thought was, it's our water, they don't have a right to take it, which wasn't correct. In our legal framework, corporations have the same rights as citizens, and so we see uh, Nestle having the ability to go in and, and pump. Initially it started from a meeting that had up in the town of, of New Haven, Naturally, Perrier hired a consultant uh, to study all of the effects of the pumping and so forth. And everything that they said, uh, you know, nothing would happen, everything would be fine, there would be no problem with the lake. I talked to my hydrology buddy and I said, Tom, he said that this isn't going to affect the spring. And Tom snorted, he's not a hydrologist, he's a hydrostitute. And we were told up there that night by their council that uh, we didn't have a chance in stopping them. But then we started having meetings and inviting people and that we were just awed by the numbers of people that would come. Older people from the area, farmers, uh, retired people. It went statewide then. And finally the incumbent governor who had opened them with welcome arms made a comment to Perrier that, hey look, the people don't want you, why don't you move out? They went to Michigan from Wisconsin. In 1892, a one-mile chunk of the Great Lakes and its waters was deeded by the Illinois legislature to a private company. 
The next legislature moved into office and voided the deed. And in 1892, the United States State Supreme Court said, these Great Lakes, they're impressed with the public trust. And under this public trust, it can't be alienated, disposed of, diverted, or tra transferred for a private purpose. That doctrine remains as lively and viable today as it did in the late 1800s. And that's exactly what became the basis of the lawsuit. MCWC was still waiting to hear the opinion when the letters from Nestle were sent to members of MCWC, young people that had expressed their opinion in the press and Nestle then, they were going to do a slap suit against them. Will corporations actually step in and sue citizen activists? Uh, usually they're suing them on something that's absolutely ridiculous and often they'll lose, but the citizen still has to spend a lot of money on lawyers' fees, has a lot of worry. This acts as a deterrent to activism and it is absolutely outrageous that corporations are being allowed to do this. And I was upset about that, but then... As far as trying to intimidate, they put heat on MCWC as an organization, and it really laid the heat in on my mom. You know, I didn't care what Nestle did to me. I was fighting, I was fighting Nestle, but no one's going to mess with, with my family, and especially my children. Well, and clearly no company wants to be in the position of, of, having, to, of having to do that sort of thing. It was simply a letter that, that simply asked them to refrain from making comments that were not true. Gosh, there's probably been three or four public hearings. Nestle was in attendance. There was newspaper press, there was television press. Just about anything I had said was either just my own opinion or else fact-based. So it was very hard to know what are they referring to. And then I said, I'll be damned if they're going to do that to me. So Nestle came to Ferris to give a presentation. My son Chris was there. My name is Chris Weir. I felt like my greatest defense was just being as public as I could. Received a letter that I, Chris Weir, am accused of slanderous or defamatory remarks. My son was shaking. I mean, he was, he was so upset. And I'm wondering if those are charges accusations, insinuations. I'd like to hear directly from your legal staff, if I could, please. It was a hard thing to watch as a mother. Uh, Chris, I, we, well, I, Fred, if you want to answer briefly, but I'd like to get to people that have questions about the project specifically, um, instead of maybe personally, okay? And the whole crowd was, was furious. But I mean... I have to tell you what, if, if in the end, Chris, there's, there's time when we want to talk about that there's no more questions about the project or water policy or groundwater, we would like to do <laughs> They never followed up and contacted me. It never materialized as far as a slap suit. It tells me it was a load of crap, just like I had suspected. The judge said, well, if there's a diminishment, that's what the law is, it's illegal, you're done. And that was the end of it, we thought. It probably took at least a year to be able to, to have our day in court. And then when you think in three days time, the Court of Appeals heard Nestle's case. Nestle then was granted permission to continue to pump 200 gallons a minute. But in doing so, the Court of Appeals changed the law. Bottled water exports or exports of water in any form are hereby prohibited. Which is very different from most uses of water. Even agricultural uses have return flows, and it's available for reuse again and again. But once you put water in a bottle and you move it out of state, it's gone. You made that a product we invested. It's a private good. You can't take it from us anymore. It's too late. You open the door. Michigan is telling the world, come in and buy water rights here. And by the way, under this case, if you can demonstrate an economic benefit of shipping it somewhere else, you can have it. Changing the way water has been perceived as a public resource in a way that we may not be able to retreat if we make a mistake. And that's the problem.
When you take water out of its natural water basin and then ship it or move it, we know something about the ecological fallout from that. We don't know the full picture. What happened to the Aral Sea? The Aral Sea was a lake, in fact, that was so huge that they called it a sea. And the countries around, of the old Soviet Union decided to grow cotton in the desert and started siphoning off this water. And it's almost completely gone now. Company comes along and says, the impact of 210 million gallons a year in a tanker truck is no different than 210 million gallons a year in a bottle. And you already let the bottled water people do that. So you have to let us do that. And so I, that's how I got uh, started in looking at bag technology. If we massively ship water out of an area, the ecosystem is disrupted. The natural habitat damaged, biodiversity reduced, and aquifers dried. The water-rich area we chose to export from will itself desertify. The thirsty populations in the water-poor deserts we ship water to will simply consume the water and send it back to the sea via its sewers, thus still remaining a desert. Where one desert region existed before, two deserts now exist. Water is a supply and demand commodity. The people that demand it don't have the supply. The supply is often in other parts of the world. The question is how to get it from source to market. This sets up a kind of contest, and that is between city people and rural people. Companies are out there constantly looking at what land the farmers own. Going from farm to farm, hello ma'am, hello sir. Now what are you doing farming all day? It must be a lot of work. I bet you get up real early and why don't you just let us rent or buy your water? And we have had uh, Texas Water come in and volunteer to build a pipeline. What I'm afraid of happening is the water will not be sold here. Into that pipeline will go out of the basin in the areas such as Santa Fe or Albuquerque. So this is a new uh, development that's taking place as, as more and more of us move into big cities and don't want to think about where water comes from. Increasingly, it's coming from the places that grow your food. <laughs> this is really, really, really short-sighted. You're using water from an ecosystem in Northern California, transporting it through um, long pipes and canals to Southern California to grow uh, alfalfa. The alfalfa is then shipped to places like Japan, where it is fed to the high-end uh, Kona beef, and then much of that beef is shipped back to the U.S. So we've set up this system of agriculture that just doesn't work anymore, and it's really based on the concept of virtual water, where we're growing crops for export in thirsty places and then moving them long distances, rather than having our food grown more locally and more sustainably. China is a very dry country, but agribusiness is moving there because there are uh, fewer laws and labor is very cheap. Almost all apple juice sold in the United States comes from China now. We're losing our ability to even grow apples because it's cheaper to produce them elsewhere. That means that a country like China that doesn't have very much water is exporting its water to the United States uh, through apples. Then we sign trade agreements like NAFTA so that our subsidized corn using water from uh, desert-like areas in the U.S. can undersell the farmers in Mexico. A lot of that water actually stays in the, the corn and is then transported to another ecosystem and is completely lost. For instance, here in Kenya, they grow most of the roses that are sold in Europe and they export them. And they're growing around a beautiful, beautiful lake called Lake Navasha, which is being depleted at an appalling rate. All done by foreign corporations, huge, great big flower plantations. If they keep doing this, within five years, it will be a putrid puddle. So here's one of the driest continents on earth, exporting water, being told by the World Bank to export its water to get its way out of debt. I call this theft. I also think it's a form 
form of murder. Joan Thorpe Root, the Academy Award nominated British wildlife filmmaker and African conservationist, lived in Kenya and made great efforts to save Lake Navasha from being destroyed. Her assassins broke the nearest window to her bed, where she was sleeping. Joan awoke. Desperately held her blanket out as a shield and charged the three men. The men fired their AK-47 assault rifles from outside the window, riddling the room with bullets through the lace curtains. Two bullets struck Joan in the leg, one hit her in the hip. Joan crawled towards her bathroom, trying to stop the bleeding with her blanket, but died of massive blood loss. You don't know when the water would flow. It, it flows once a week, and you don't know the date, the time. So you are forced to open up the tap. When they open their taps, it's air. And when the air blows through the taps, the meters are running. And they are charged for doing this. There's a pipe coming up, and between the pipe and the tap, there's a water meter. And you have to pay for an electronic key to get charged up. And you can look at it, and you can see the water meter counting every single drop. And as one friend of mine said, I can afford about two flushes a month from this thing. That's how expensive it is. You know, they just throw their hands up in despair, and they go back to that river that has cholera warning signs on it. If people don't have money to buy water, they go to polluted streams, they get sick, the, the, the state has to pay for, the, for their, for their health care. You know, why don't you just use money for the necessary thing and to prevent other things that might come up? unemployed and I buy water, I'm going to limit or ration the people who are, living, who are living in that house. That's why then you get domestic violence. Because now, I want to do my laundry, but because my sister is the only one employed, she determines when I do my laundry. You know, parents will take the, the tokens that they use into making sure that the water can run, you know, wherever they go, maybe to work and all that. And then during the day, kids don't have water. And this other woman who lived in a shack with two kids took the token and went with it to work. And the shack caught fire. And there was no water to, to stop the fire. And even the neighbors are saying, we don't, have, we don't have money to stop hair fire, you know? These projects are taking away our humaneness. I was in grade one, I was, I was six, so I didn't really think about much. I thought the whole world was go to school, don't get your parents too angry. You do a charity project each year at our school. You do your canned food drives, you do your raise money for cancer. That year we were raising money for developing countries. And for one penny you could get a pencil, five pennies you could get uh, soup for the day or things like this. And then she got to a point where she said $70 would buy a well. And then she explained to us, yeah, people are dying because they don't have clean water. They were just disbelieving that. What do you mean you can get sick from water and that you don't have things to clean yourself with, let alone drink the water? Then we asked, well, if they want water, how far would they have to go? And she said, like, uh, sometimes as far as 10,000 steps. I counted the steps it took me to get from my classroom to the water fountain, and I counted 10. She said, yeah, $70 would buy a well, and it would stop it so people wouldn't have to walk so far. So I thought, okay, that sounds like a good idea, so I'll go home to my mom and dad. They have lots of money, right? And uh, the problem would be solved, and no one would die anymore. And I thought it was a great plan. And we thought, oh, isn't that cute? You know, he wants to build a well. Let's make dinner. Because he was so young, we really did not take him seriously. You don't get it. He said someone just died because they don't have clean water, and you didn't help them. After a few days, they finally sat me down and they said, what we can do is give you a chance to earn the money by doing extra chores around the house. Never ever thinking that he would follow through. And I got a, a piece of blank paper, 
and threw a thermometer on it, 2468 all the way up to 70, to give him a sense of how long it was going to take him to get there. After, I guess, four months, I raised the $70. I brought it into an organization that facilitates clean water projects in developing countries. And they looked at me and they said, it's going to cost a bit more than $70 to build an actual well. And I've always felt bad about telling them that the, the well wasn't really $70, that it was actually the minimum you could get was 2000 But I've sort of consoled myself a little by saying that if it had been more, if I'd told him 2000 at that time, that he never would have gone. That would have been too big for a six-year-old. So I started doing public speaking around my community. It slowly grew and grew and grew. The Brian's Well Foundation has been established. And we've helped raise about $2 million, which has gone towards the completion of 266 water and sanitation projects, helping about half a million people. Immediate aid like this is absolutely vital to saving lives. But if we step back, a larger question looms. An uncomfortable question we habitually avoid in our daily discussions. Why do these countries need emergency aid to provide something as basic as water? Why are they unable to build their own infrastructure of clean water delivery? Why are they poor? Developing countries are forced to grow cash crops, export crops like tea or coffee. We've got some resources, especially tea, which is really growing all of our the World Bank and uh, the IMF and uh, the other countries, especially the Western world, that buys the tea from our, our country always gives us a raw deal. You find that we are given so little money for this tea. The World Trade Organization has required developing countries to remove tariffs so that products can flow uh, in and out of the country because it benefits our corporations. They, they get cheap products. Now what that means is that developing countries are very hurt. And it's obscene. <laughs> it's why these countries can't get out of debt. And it's why these countries can't develop water systems or healthcare or anything else for their kids. And there's a famous Senate hearing where a very senior World Bank official told the U.S. Senate, don't worry, it, we're not giving money away particularly for every dollar the United States invests in the developing world through the World Bank. Um, American corporations get back $1.30. You know, wink, wink. We call it aid, it, development aid, but really it's forcing countries to open up their resources. And that's why there's such a tremendous reaction against the World Bank in the third world. Uh, if uh, we were to sell this tea, at the right price, if we had fair trade in the markets, our tea could fetch enough money that can sustain most of our needs. It should be a very rich country. We cannot fight the world water crisis by just saying, let's hook up some more people and hope that does it. We have to challenge the systems that deliberately create winners from losers. And then who cares about the losers? That They're losers <laughs> and it's their own fault anyway. That's the system we have to take on, and we will never, 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 never solve the world water crisis until we have the courage to talk about the world political and economic system. Wherever a river flowing free is now treated as the supplier of raw material as if it was oil, we have the generation of water wars. The Chinese, the symbol for, for water, not only means water, it means control, which I think is quite profound in the sense that controlling water is everything. And the word rivals, for instance, comes from Latin meaning river. The rivals were people standing on either side of the river throwing things at each other. And you're just going to see more of that as the technology develops to be able to suck uh, water out of the atmosphere. Now you're going to find water from the atmosphere and clouds being stolen. New techniques for controlling the weather are being tried. When conditions are right, rain is made to fall by seeding clouds with dry ice or silver iodide. It's happening in China and some other places where a particular village pays for a, a plane to go up. They make it rain before the cloud gets to the next village. So there's uh, real anger and, and real political tension. The 
worst case is Southern California. And LA is part of what I call hydraulic civilizations, like Rome and its aqueducts was a hydraulic civilization. But there, the longest aqueduct was 60 miles. The longest you have to go once measured it is 1,400 miles from the furthest source of water for LA to a home in the town. And LA has not yet figured out what its limit should be. I mean, it doesn't want a limit. In the LA area itself, which is about 18 million, if it was on its own water, it would only be 3 million. First thing LA is going to do is try to put a lot of farmers out of work and close down the farms and take that water. When the water system doesn't work, then the civilization goes. The most famous conflict occurred in the Owens Valley and Mulholland was the head of the water department there and noticed that it was pretty much a downhill run to LA in the 1920s. And so he got together a whole bunch of investors to divert all the water from Mono Lake and send it down through an aqueduct to LA. It put the farmers out of business and there was a big violent rebellion in two different instances tried to blow up the aqueduct. They partially succeeded once and then they were arrested and then they sent in kind of goon squads <laughs> to get rid of the farmers and then they paid them off. The last great water war in the United States was 1934 when Arizona sent in the National Guard because California, again, was building a dam across the Colorado to divert the water to California without giving Arizona any. And the ferry captain that took people across the Colorado put a cannon on the front of her ferry and they went up and threatened the dam. But it led to the Secretary of the Interior to stop the dam. One of the most bloody water wars is still being fought over the river Calvary, that farmers of Karnataka and farmers of Tamil Nadu both required more water out of that river. A bandit of Tamil origin, Virupan kidnapped a Karnataka actor with the demand that large amounts of water be released to Tamil Nadu. It was really as a chess game in the water wars. I was doing a major study on conflicts over resources for the United Nations University. This fat file of mine on river water conflicts suddenly had no more coverage because the entire issue was now being presented as an issue for religion, not water demands and water conflicts. So many water wars are presented as religious conflicts when in reality they are fundamental conflicts over resources. Well, I want to tell you about one country tonight, and that's the country of Bolivia, South America's poorest country. Several years ago, the World Bank refused to guarantee a $25 million loan to finance the investment program of the local water co-op and forced Bolivia to sell its water systems to a subsidiary of Bechtel. Uh, the water prices now account in Bolivia for more than the, they pay for food. Well, I have a story to tell you tonight, and that is that the people rose up in Bolivia. Obrero industrial, y cuando en Bolivia se privatizó el agua, la gente, nosotros no podíamos concebir que un empresario privado, un inversionista transnacional, podía apropiarse del agua. Es decir, la gente o tenía que pagar del agua o tenía que dejar de comer y por lo tanto no tuvo otra alternativa que decir no a la privatización del agua. Eh, una rebelión popular, una forma organizativa de multitudes de gente que desde los campesinos hasta los vendedores de las calles eh, y eh, empezamos una resistencia, el, el gobierno eh, sacó al ejército de la policía para garantizar la seguridad jurídica de la empresa, garantizar las utilidades y las ganancias de la compañía. But it's really interesting, as you know, the World Bank has imposed the same kind of private control and takeover of many other things in developing countries, healthcare, education, their energy sector, their mines and so on. But when it comes to water, 
something happens and people say, I couldn't stop you there, or I didn't know how, or I thought maybe you would be right, but you are not taking my local water. Asociados de una abierta complicidad de los gobernantes en ese tiempo en Bolivia, que inclusive se privatizó el agua de la lluvia, es decir, que se prohibía a la gente el acumular el agua de la lluvia. And this is where you get the civil wars because the army is brought in to control local dissent against these transnational corporations. Who are you protecting? There's your people without drinking water and you're protecting foreign investors from North America and Europe? Más de 100 heridos de bala. Numerosos detenidos. Civil, hubieron más de 20 francotiradores que mataron e hirieron a la gente. 17-year-old Victor Hugo Doza was killed by a shot through his face. geopolitical picture emerging here where the world map will be rewritten and redesigned. They've already mapped out uh, what are going to be the, the, the most intense areas of potential conflict in the next uh, 10, 15 and 20 years. So the, the water rich areas of the world are Brazil, Canada, Russia. So these big superpowers are beginning to position themselves in such a way that water, like energy, is seen as part of their future security, including their military security, including their commercial security. And they're beginning to, to understand they have to secure future sources of water. The U.S. is doing military training around the Great Lakes, and 80 mayors of towns and cities around the lakes have asked the U.S. government to suspend this, but they're not going to. I got involved in this issue in the mid-1980s when Canada was negotiating a free trade agreement with the United States and the free trade agreement included water as a good. There was a statement made by one of the participants that uh, Canadian water would be flowing to the United States Midwest from the Canadian North by pipeline within two to five years. Who knew? And move that water into a crater in the Rocky Mountains, which would be kind of like a huge mega reservoir. And nobody will stand up in our country to the United States administration and say, this is our water, because they know that the United States would consider that as serious as if we put missiles along the Canada-US border. It just would not be tolerated in the US. In the new regime, where water is being treated like oil, the protection of that commodity is being ensured through a militarized defense. And the good part of Brazil sits over top of the largest aquifer in the world, which is called the Guarani Aquifer. This is going to be a major source of uh, fresh water in the future. Very recently, the United States has established a military base located just inside the border of Paraguay. As you know, the United States itself is running out of water. Water is becoming more and more uh, a matter of priority in American foreign policy. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld went to, on a quiet mission to a number of Latin American places, including Paraguay, to try to see what kind of further advancement could be made regarding the presence of U.S. Uh, forces in that region. Shortly after uh, Rumsfeld's visit, uh, something like 500 special forces were stationed at the military base there in Paraguay. Este caso, no momento agora, quando os países tomaram conhecimento, já tinha sido aprovado pelo Parlamento do Paraguai. It remains to be seen what will happen and what they're doing there exactly as to whether the purpose of that uh, military base is really to secure a military presence at a very pivotal location for uh, exercising some measure of control over the uh, Guarani uh, aquifer and water takings from the Guarani aquifer. In the last few weeks, there's been a report in the media about George W. Bush, the president, purchasing land in Paraguay 
the speculation is that that has to do with uh, wanting to have access to the aquifer and pump water out of the aquifer. Jenna Bush, who is uh, the daughter of George W. Bush, had uh, paid a uh, quiet 10-day visit to Paraguay, in particular meeting with top officials in the government. And as it turned out, what was happening, at least this was what the speculation was in, in the press, was that she was about to facilitate the purchase of something like 100,000 acres of land in Paraguay in her family name. At the same time, though, that that was happening, it was discovered that George Bush Sr. already had something like 173,000 acres of land. Was this uh, an example of uh, the Bush oil family now switching from black gold to blue gold, turning to water and purchasing water? Clearly after that, there were a series or a string of denials on the part of the Bush uh, family, not directly. They did it through agencies, U.S. government agencies. Eles negam a construção da base. The world's largest dam is located very close to, the, to that area. And so that also was a, a matter of considerable interest for, for the U.S. as well. Os americanos, não diria o povo americano, mas uma parte dos americanos, principalmente de seus governos, tem uma visão muito militarista, economicista e predadora. E quando não conseguem no convencimento, vão pela força. A visão economicista, a visão imediatista, é a mesma visão que levou em outro campo ao americano ter o que teve no Vietnã, como agora no Iraque. Será que essas lições eles não aprenderam ainda? I mean, there's no question that uh, that region of the world is the Middle East of water uh, in the future. And just two days ago, the Bolivian government gave in and kicked Bechtel out of the country. Humble Bolivians, led by a 45-year-old, kicked one of the world's biggest engineering companies out of the country for its criminal behavior and told the World Bank to go the hell with it. Bueno, dos días después de la victoria popular, eh, yo tuve la posibilidad de viajar a Washington. Primera vez en mi vida que salí a Estados Unidos. Segunda vez en mi vida que salí fuera de mi país. And this simple shoemaker from Cochabamba, Bolivia, gave one of the most moving speeches I have ever heard. Solo somos dueños del agua y del aire. The only thing that is ours anymore is our water and our air posibilitó la pérdida del miedo que se tiene frente a los poderes constituidos económicos, financieros, políticos y militares. Es que la única fuerza capaz de transformar el mundo, capaz de transformar la sociedad, es esa capacidad de unidad, de organización y de movilización de la gente frente a cualquier poder. And people were so moved, they not only clapped for him, they got up on their chairs and took a standing ovation that wouldn't end. It was just a stellar moment. Because um, this is a really scary story, and it's a true story, and we really are running out of water. It doesn't have to be that way, okay? And that's the most important thing to say is that it's not too late. The earth is amazingly elastic in terms of coming back. It's, it's the, the ability of the earth to renew itself is stunning. Aj najlepšou formou boja proti e, privatizácii vodných zdrojov je mať viacej vody okolo seba vo svojom životnom prostredí. Je to vlastne Gandhi o filozof. Blízko svojho vo svojom prostredí a tým pádom stráca zmysel obchodovania s vodou. Riešením je veľmi jednoduché. Vrátiť vodu do, do vodného cyklu a začať zavodňovať krajinu daždivou vodou. We need to dig holes. If we dig holes in the sand, we can trick the water into staying so it doesn't run away to a river or ocean when it rains. The water will sit in the holes and soak into the ground. Then more trees will grow. Uh, we prepare very simple, very cheap uh, solution and we invite youngsters and volunteers every year uh, about uh, summer camp, uh, two uh, weeks. Uh, about uh, 40 to 100 people. 
make manually, for example, small wooden dams on small streams, on water holdings, and to accumulate water. There's a huge difference between these water catchments and dams, because dams, what happens is that is a large amount of water, a land area gets flooded, we create these huge reservoirs, then the water becomes stagnant in them, and the mercury, it starts to uh, spread throughout the, the water system itself, and it creates a whole different set of problems. In these water catchments, what happens is that the water is trapped so that it goes right into the ground itself and therefore starts to replenish the, uh, the groundwater systems. A môžeme vlastne mať zo žltej krajiny zelenú. Pre, povedzme, pre vysúšené regióny sveta, ktoré môže with creation of clouds in atmosphere and create of raining. This model can to create million and million jobs for poor people around the globe. Blue alternative solution is very easy, simple, cheap, solving of complex problem. And it, quite frankly, is the antidote to uh, desalinization. This is the kind of approach that we need to take in order to revitalize and rebuild our groundwater systems. And then we have to stop going into the groundwater and taking it out in such a phenomenally cavalier way. In the U.S., the largest amount of groundwater is being used for agriculture. And you really have to deal with agriculture to solve our water problems. The water efficiency with hydroponic systems is 20 to 30 times more efficient than crops growing outdoors. The reason is that we are placing the water directly to the base of the crop through drip or trickle irrigation systems. We can take that fish called tilapia, and when they grow in this water, we can take that nutrient-rich water and go on to crops with that. And any excess of water going on to the roots, it's collected. It can go back to the fish and then go through the system again. And it's these technologies that will save this planet in the next century. What we really need to do is go back to a food system where we're not dependent on global trade and where we're really using our local water and soil resources to grow crops that are appropriate. There's a move towards decommissioning these dams, taking them down, and that movement, that trend towards decommissioning is really important, but it sets the stage also that we need to move towards alternative ways of supplying uh, the power that's necessary, whether it be through these micro turbines That are in stream completely. You don't need a dam to hold back water. They just use the natural flow of rivers or coasts. Korea is, has been investing in this technology. Um, Scandinavia has. I mean, they're sort of seeing their era of large dam building coming to an end as well. As we expand urbanization to meet our growing population needs, there are alternative permeable pavement solutions which allow rainwater to infiltrate through into the subsoil. Pollutants from cars are filtered and removed and thus do not pollute the groundwater. The water quality is actually improved. Even with these advancements, the ultimate development solution is to limit the population growth of a region pending on the available water supply, which is exactly what the citizens of Bolinas, California did. And so the towns decided that they would put a moratorium on all housing growth until they had adequate supply of water. And that water moratorium was challenged immediately and was in courts for 14 years. They just didn't want a town to be able to control growth. They considered an interference with commerce. But ultimately, we won, and yeah, it's working. What we can learn from the Bolinas example is the whole challenge to learn to live within the limits of our watersheds. And in this village where we really have shortage of water, we use uh, some water that is being uh, poured on you, on your hands, as you wash your hands. Uh, sparingly, and people really value any amount of water that they have. It's exactly the opposite of America. I mean, America could save 20 to 30 percent of its water really easily. If we adopted the toilet style of Israel, for instance, which has a two buttons, one for urine and one for feces. The one for urine is less than a quart. You know, everybody takes water for granted. Uh, we're going to have to, to grow a constituency for water issues. Uh, think about climate change. 
Groups have been working on climate change for 20 years, and it's taken that long for the general public to be aware of it and for us to begin to make the legislative and regulatory changes that are necessary to really solve the problem. We need to do that for water. To call for a United Nations convention that explicitly states that water is a human right and a public trust that must not be denied to anyone on the basis of inability to pay demanding that we put this language in an international framework at the United Nations. Because the operations of these corporations, these water barons, have now gone global, this has gone beyond nation-state law and requires us to bring in some kind of instrument at an international level to control these companies. And that led to the really exciting change in Uruguay. In Uruguay, se privatizó el servicio de distribución de agua potable. A poco de haberse establecido, los precios se elevaron exorbitantemente. El agua que se distribuyó en algún momento estuvo contaminada. Se llegó incluso a cortarle el servicio a una escuela. Los uruguayos, con una larga tradición democrática, promovieron la reforma de la Constitución. Where citizens were able to pass a constitutional amendment that actually established the right to water and and forbids privatization. That's the model that we've been using when we talk to groups around the world and the model that we're promoting. So we're looking for a small group of nations to begin a process within the process in the United Nations. There are some powerful countries opposing the right to water, most prominently the United States. To my eternal shame, my own country, Canada. It has a lot of water resources and they're concerned about having to use, uh, send water to the United States. China, Egypt, Australia, and possibly India. They don't want to have to be responsible for providing their citizens water. This is, a, this is life and death what we're talking about. And I feel very, very strongly that we have to put ourselves out there on the line. And sometimes it can be dangerous, but we have people power on our side. To the disapproval of the citizens of the small town of Freiburg, Maine, the water bottling company Poland Springs set up a plant. To appease the population, Poland Springs gave away a case of bottled water to the first 50 townspeople to visit their office. Led by 89-year-old Republican store owner Howard Dearborn, they poured the bottled water into Lovewell's pond back where it came from. This week at the World Social Forum is being launched an historic organization, the African Water Network. A world that is trying to say no to commodification of our common goods like water. To mobilize and protect Africa's precious water sources from abuse and from corporate theft. Now we have a defiance campaign that says, okay, you can install your meter. After you turn your back, we take it out, we connect the pipes, and then we throw your meter away. The court case has cost over a million dollars. We've done a lot of innovative fundraising, and you have to realize that we're just uh, normal, ordinary people who are living day to day and and fighting, you know, this giant. I play sports. I hang out with my friends, I do all that regular stuff any teenager would do. It's just that I do this on the side. I just wanted to get people clean water so they wouldn't die. I guess being that young sort of helped a lot because I think I was too young to be nervous. You just see smiles light up on people's faces because they have clean water to drink. A smile doesn't light up on my face because I can have a shower in the morning. None of these people, I don't know if there was an activist in the group. You, when you come from the grassroots, I think legislators look at it totally differently than they do if you are an activist. And I think that's what we had, is they couldn't go back on us and say, you guys are always out there raising a ruckus. Probably the end result isn't going to affect any of us because we're going to be gone. But we're fighting for the people that are going to use it in the future, our kids and their kids. If we don't do something to save it, what are they going to have? Bottom line is, those people are there. And I'm talking Republicans, Democrats, and everything else in between and beyond. They're there because if money is more important than water, where are we? Our previous mayor was indicted and, and tried and is, is currently serving time. Et le maire, ministre de la communication, 
euh, a été euh, mis en examen, puis euh, emprisonné euh, avant d'être condamné. We've made some serious enemies. I've made some serious enemies for myself. But as my mother would say, serious people have serious enemies. Because it's not going to necessarily happen through governments alone. It's not going to happen through, through industry and by corporations. We, the people, must become the water guardians of the 21st century. What water is in my backyard? What's the name of the watershed I live in? We should all know that. Just the way we know our town and our state. And then ask the question, where does your drinking water come from? And where does your wastewater go? Just start asking the questions. You don't even have to do anything. Just ask the questions. Even though my brother is six, turning seven, and I'm eight, turning nine, I still can't do the monkey bars, and my brother can. They were selling Ice Mountain at the caf school cafeteria. My principal came into my class, and then I told my teacher that I had to talk to her about the Ice Mountain thing. This is my problem poster about what Ice Mountain is doing. They're draining the lakes. When they drain the lakes, they're also draining the springs and the wells. And oh, this is just like one of my little glow-in-the-dark things. Before Ice Mountain, after Ice Mountain, mud flat. And then over here, the solution. Send letters to the decision makers. Boycott Ice Mountain. I showed these posters to the school board, my class, and the um, student council. Michigan, despite lawsuit in court. Well, Mrs. Hart, she said that there was going to be no more ice mountain in the entire school district. A bunch of articles just because of one little thing I did. And also, most importantly, let your voice be heard. Like. The one time when I was at a meat store, I saw that they sold Ice Mountain, and then I talked to the store manager, and then he said, okay. And then the next time when I went, no Ice Mountain the entire store. I felt very happy because I knew that I did the right thing.